Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the second webinar of IT Leadership, a short course presented by IT Masters on behalf of Charles Sturt University. My name is Guy Coward, and I'm short courses MC for IT Masters. Your course mentor is renowned author Brenton Birchmore, who will join us soon. Wherever you're watching this, we hope you're safe and well and in a pleasant space. Using Zoom for our webinars allows us to encourage questions and the use of chat during these sessions. We ask that you direct all questions relevant to course content to the Q&A section and that you send all course administration questions to Hannah in the chat. You can chat with us directly in the chat box. We're designated as panelists or to everyone listening live. And you can make that choice by toggling through the drop down box options once you've opened the, the chat log. We'll have a long Q&A session at the end of the webinar and I'll interrupt Brenton if a question comes in that is particularly relevant to a particular slide. Thanks as ever to Hannah, who is essentially responsible for these short courses and makes them happen. Um, and is also responsible for the course page, learn.itmasters.edu.au, which is where you'll find all of the materials needed for this course, links to Brenton's fantastic audio lectures, um, all of the extra uh, snippets of information, discussion forums, um, the module quizzes, and eventually the exam. We're talking to about IT project management tonight as the slides say, and the, the one talking is the one who developed much of what and how we teach in our post-grad courses at, at Charles Sturt Uni and IT Masters. Welcome back, Brenton, on behalf of everyone. Uh, what tales of the week? How are you doing? Hi there. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Good morning. Good afternoon. Welcome back. We are... Uh, where's my image? There I am. We are uh, getting into the exciting end of uh, the project now, project management. We're going to talk about Agile, of course, because that's what IT project management loves to be. Uh, I'm well. We are uh, safe and happy here. And my son has just told me that he's got a holiday tomorrow. We're not going to school. These things come out of the blue, mm. uh, incredibly sudden. He's known about it for a long time, I'm sure. But, uh, but So he's got plans tonight, stay up late, play all day tomorrow. So Catch up on that. 20,000 hours on his old man. That's it. Uh, it's, it. It's a hard slog for him. He's got to work on keeping <laughs> up with the gaming hours, right? <laughs> so thanks for tuning in again, everyone. We are going to do a similar idea to what we did last week. We're going to talk about IT project management, which is really agile. And we're going to look at it from three different angles, four different angles. Uh, we are going to talk about it from a leadership point of view all the way through. We are going to talk about Agile from a philosophical point of view. I want to break down some myths and try to introduce some truths. And we're going to talk a bit about Scrum, although we aren't going to have time to go into a lot of detail about Scrum. But I'll give you the picture of Scrum based on the philosophy that we've just talked about. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the strategic, large-scale use of Agile, some things like SAFE, etc. And again, we won't go into the details of that, but I want to use all these to try to build a picture of how leadership, decision makers, senior stakeholders within IT need to deal with agility in general. And when I talk about project management, I'm really talking about getting stuff done, getting large organized things done. And what does agility really mean for that? Now, this is a refresh of what we've what we showed you last week what we're going to talk about we are at the this point week two we are talking about agile and we're going to dispel some myths create some understanding we are then going to talk next week about business analysis and then finally it governance today we are going to cover what is agile and many of you will have experienced agile many of you will already have some familiarity some of you are probably doing it some of you are probably well trained well qualified and highly experienced at it but most likely, everyone's doing it a little bit your way. And that's a good thing. That's how it should be. So I'm going to step back from that a little bit and try to find some of the common ground that might help even those of you who are very experienced at it to see different ways and different applications of what you already know. We will talk a bit about Scrum, its major ingredients and components. Uh, uh, how it delivers results in IT. We'll talk about all of that on a slightly larger scale and I'll introduce SAFE or really just one thing 
from the SAFE framework that is useful in scaling up Agile. Now, as usual, and as Guy has said, uh, he'll be keeping an eye on the questions if something really fascinating pops in. We'll look at it and pause for it. Uh, do put the questions in there when you think of them, because obviously you might not think of it again later. Uh, and we'll do, get as much of them done as we can at the end, because we have a bit more time then. Mm, and we've got so, one. We've got a good one to start, out? Brenton. Yeah. Um, okay. Just something sort of back to back to fundamentals. What is the difference between project management and IT project management? Uncertainty. It's the unknowns. Uh, it's the empirical nature, and it's a good question to begin with because it really is where we have to start our discussion. Because the difference with IT or the difference with tech projects in general is reduced predictability. And we have to deal with that somehow. It's the simple fact that Agile and Scrum and things like it were created because we just simply cannot plan in advance everything we need to because we just don't know. And if we try to force that and make a decision and say, well, this is how it's going to be, just as often that turns out to be wrong. And it's nobody's fault because we didn't know enough. We couldn't have got that question right unless we were just plain lucky. And IT projects don't usually survive on luck. Well, they, they do sometimes, but they don't rely on, like they do sometimes, but they shouldn't rely on luck. So we go with a different way of making decisions. And that's all this is. It's just a different way of making decisions. So think of that. that that's all we're going to be talking about. And that's going to cover everything in these differences. So Agile in a nutshell, these are just elements that we're going to talk about in a little more detail. It's about discovery. Empirical projects means things we don't yet know. Things we can't yet make a decision about because we haven't yet revealed what's it going to look like. Can it be done? How well could be done? What it's going to look like? What can we get for that amount of time that we have or the resources that we can apply? Empirical means that it's a process of discovery. We need a method of dealing with that when you can't plan for something that you don't know yet. Agile has iterations. Everything is cyclic. And with a large waterfall activity, you do lots of planning up front, and then you do lots of activity after that. The Agile mindset begins with the idea that, well, let's just shorten that cycle and then have a few cycles. So you have iterations, and they look different in different projects, but the iteration will look will have certain ingredients and components to it that we'll talk about shortly but it's a cyclic repeat of a series of question and answer that happens on a short scale agile is not about a scope of work it's not about uh, delivering to specifications it's about delivering value and the great thing about agile or agile projects is that what we consider valuable is allowed to change. So you can have projects where the customer, the end result, doesn't even know exactly what they want because they're not entirely sure of what could be done. And sometimes they discover along the way things that they now want, different value, higher value, other value. And a traditional planned project What's that going to do to us? Well, it's going to make you fill out a lot of change control forms. So with value as a hallmark of what Agile is trying to deliver, we get to put the, the shoe on the other foot. We get to say, well, no, it's about the result. And so what needs to give or give way in the process that lets the result be more important? Now, this makes things harder. This makes our journey harder in some ways. Our cure for that, our antidote, is not just a methodology like Scrum. It is the people. Inevitably, what Agile will do is elevate the expectations and the freedoms and the ability to contribute of the people involved. Their expertise becomes more valuable, more important. Planning, to describe it harshly and perhaps unfairly, is about dumbing down the decisions that happen later because you've already made them. That's what the plan is. And so you're less dependent 
upon clever people doing clever things to make clever decisions later. Agile says, no, we want that. We want those clever decisions later because we can't make them yet. So if you want to make clever decisions later, you need good information, of course, but you also need clever people doing clever things, or at the very least, people doing clever things. Generally, you use Agile when you want something new. If you're building a bridge, you might not be very Agile about it. You, know, you might not decide, well, look, you know, we got halfway across, we're doing three lanes. We maybe just bring it down to two now. Probably not, unless you're a harbor tunnel or something. That can happen. But no, that, that, that was, they changed that before they started digging, right? Essentially, when we focus on the idea that it's empirical, it's discovery, it's an exploration, you've got to ask different questions. Different questions matter up front and different questions matter later. And you, instead of making every decision up front, you get to say, well, some of these decisions are actually important now because they have dependencies. They are things that other things will depend upon. Let's isolate those decisions, make them, and then delay the ones that we can make later. Now, I want to talk about the mindset. I want to talk a bit about the mindset. One of the things that in, I've encountered is, and I'm going to stereotype here, right? So don't think that I'm unfairly assuming that everyone is in one of these two camps, because we're not. We're all a little bit of everything. But I want to outline two different perspectives. And I've called them planists or reactivists. And I don't think that's really a word, but we've just invented it. So we'll, we'll, we'll use it. <laughs> I love it. We're not shy about those things around here. So what's a planist? So a, a planist is the sort of person, and when, I, when we talk through this, you know, some of you will say, yeah, yeah, that's me, right? And some of you will say, I, I know who that is. I know that person, I work with them, right? Uh, someone who is a planist who loves plans, they want plans, and they don't really want to do anything until they decided what they're going to do, until it's all clear and it's all mapped out. There are reasons for this. And as a leader of IT, we have to accept that this isn't a methodology problem. This isn't a training problem. This isn't something that they're doing wrong. This is the kind of person they are, and we need to adapt in some way to who they are. So why do these people want planning? Why does anyone who enjoys working with plans, what do they want? It's all about stress reduction. In fact, if you look at most of what we do and most of the decisions that humans make, a lot of it is about stress management, a stress response. So for some people, a desire to have a plan, things sorted out in advance, helps them manage the stress that they would feel. Because if they get surprises, if, it's, if they don't know where they're going, what they're doing, what people are worried about is, well, this activity I'm about to do, is it worthwhile or could it be wasted? Am I about to waste my effort here? And for some people, that's very stressful. It's a worry. And they don't want to invest in something. They're not all in on some activities if they're worried about, well, is, is it really worth it? Is it going to be something? I want to see the plan that tells me what I should be doing because I don't want to be doing something I might not. So allowing people to join the dots can allow people to let go of that stress and say, well, the plan says this. I'm not responsible for the plan. I'm responsible for doing my bit in the plan. And I don't want to be responsible for more than that. That's stressful. I don't want to be responsible for the uncertainty. I just want to do my bit. I want to join the dots. So to some extent, quite aside from the practical benefits of planning, there is a stress response benefit for a portion of the people we work with. And what about the other side of the equation? Right? Before, well, me, you, me, before you go, Brenton, uh, I, I just want to launch a poll, which I just chucked in there. Ah, okay. Good work. And maybe I'll ask the question after the next slide too. We've got plan, which are you? Are you a planist or reactivist? Planist, reactivist, both but planist, both but reactivist. I think they're fairly self-explanatory. And these aren't words. They are just not words, Brenton. And therefore I reject your very question. That's, that's not even sitting on the fence. That's rejecting the fence. <laughs> <laughs> and fair enough too, I think. So <laughs> Louis Pasteur, uh, do you know who Louis Pasteur was? Uh, French... Cheese, did, uh, milk, milk processes. Yes, pasteurization of milk, uh, a French chemist. 
And one of the interesting things about his story is that he discovered the process entirely by accident. However, it was his many years of familiarity and knowledge of chemistry that allowed him to recognize the brilliance of the accident that he just witnessed and what it really meant. And that was why he was quoted as saying, fortune favors the prepared mind. It was all of his knowledge and expertise that allowed him to understand what pasteurization does. Well, we, we, he didn't call it that. Maybe he did. We call it <laughs> pasteurization of milk. <laughs> yeah, I tried it with all my school bags because um, it was a filthy bag, wasn't it? Uh, I, I, I just got disgusting rotten bananas. Anyway, we've got 75% uh, of people voted. Uh, both, but Planist is the leader, 40%-ish. Planist, 24%. So we've got a lot of planners in here uh, and, and a minority of reactivists. Anyway, we'll share that result and then we can go through okay. the other poll. Um, maybe we've skewed the results slightly because I, mm. I, I haven't, haven't finished talking all about what reactivists are. Maybe some people might change their mind and that's okay. Everyone say to it. Uh, do you want to leave that up or close it? I think you can close it now. I, I will close it. Everyone else should be able to as well. So let's talk about reactivists. What are we talking about with reactivists? Uh, these are the people that are more likely to say, plan, what, what plan? I don't remember. I'm not focused on those details. I, I didn't catch all of that. Uh, don't worry, I'll figure it out when we get there. Uh, and they prefer that. And the decisions they make, like compared to planning, planning the decisions are made. But reactivists are preferring to make the decisions or at least be involved in the decision. The decisions they make come from not from a plan. What to do today comes from a broader perspective on the vision of where they're going and the context. They are happier to make the decisions and they are less trusting of decisions that or planning that they weren't involved in. All right, so their stress comes from not being sure that is that plan still good today? Because I've got some new info here. I, I've got some new news. There's stuff going on here. And maybe that plan's not right anymore. Maybe it shouldn't have been. Maybe those decisions should not have been made that way. So plans and planning are not the same thing to a reactivist. In fact, they're not the same thing to agile. Let's talk about that point for a second, right? Uh, in fact, it was Dwight Eisenhower in the context of World War II was quoted as saying, I find plans useless, but I find planning indispensable. The idea is that planning is the process of evaluation. It's the process of considering, prioritizing, uh, weighing things up. But a plan is when you lock it down. Planning is incredibly valuable, even for agile projects. Considering what you might decide before you decide it, and then reconsidering it later has twice the value because when you're in the moment and having to make reactive decisions in an agile environment, the pre-decision making that you've already done, the considering of things will drastically shorten the time required to make a decision on the spot and will increase the quality of that decision. So for people that are reactivists in nature, the expectations of just do it this way, that's stressful the inflexibility of them feeling like, well, this might not be the right thing to do anymore. That's stress inducing for people of that mindset. So being able to react to that, being able to adapt, that is a stress response for them. Wanting to adapt, wanting to change things is a stress response. So as a leader, we need to deal with both camps and whether or not we say, okay, this is gonna be waterfall, this bit is gonna be waterfall and this bit is gonna be agile and scrum, you're going to have people that are reacting to both of those things. They're going to be stressed by one and stressed by the other. As leaders, that's what you're dealing with. You're dealing with people's stress, not their lack of training, not their lack of motivation. That's what we're dealing with. Fortune favors something else. According to Desiderius Erasmus, it was a Dutch pastor um, quite a few hundred years before Louis. Uh, one of the foremost minds of the Renaissance, apparently, in the northern regions at least. And he is famous saying, fortune favours the brave, the willing, those who are prepared to step into the unknown and make a decision later. 
That's what he means with this. And yeah, fortune favors both. And agile is both. So what Hang we on, say, what is agile? Let's go say? back. Let's go back. You've just. Okay. Because Hugh Bryant yeah. wants to change his vote okay. uh, in the chat. Um, mm, a little bit more even, I think. Pure planists seems to have dropped. Both but planists seems to have risen. Mm. Yeah, that was about 41. There's now 44. And uh, we've lost 10% in planist. So um, quite interesting. And very much fewer saying these aren't words. <laughs> interesting. Thanks, Brendan. I'll share them. And down there. Okay. So what is Agile? have in store for both of these groups and what are we saying to the planists we say that our best decisions are going to be based on the most current information the best information which we don't yet have but that's what we need to make our best decisions we also say that our objectives what we really want to do is only as stable as the customer's understanding of that and if the customer's still not sure about exactly what they want we have to be unsure as well. So we have to respond to that uncertainty by the customer. But we're making all the same decisions just at a different time and a different order. We will make every one of the decisions that a fully planned project would make. Actually, maybe we make a few more, but we make them at a different time. To those who are reactivist in nature, Agile has this message. We need a strong source of alignment because you're not working alone. Sure, you can react to everything, you can adapt, you can make all the decisions that you need to on the spot, but you're not alone here. You're part of a team and we need something to align that team so that everyone's effort is creating a combined outcome. Some kind of contextual glue is needed. That means some kind of contextual restriction is needed, boundaries. And whilst the journey might be flexible and we're willing to adapt and we're gonna make lots of decision on the go, there's going to have to be an end result that someone's gonna pay for. And that's our boss. We have to be answerable to that. We cannot be utterly flexible and bring too much of our own opinion into the decisions. We're still answerable to the fundamental outcome. Same decisions we're going to make just at a different time, different order. So if this is the mindset, if this is some of the thinking we have to deal with, the key, the common factor we're talking about, which I've already mentioned earlier, is value. And I want to draw out the ideas of value for a little bit. With an agile project, value is the ultimate goal. And this gives us two things. It gives us a bit more freedom to adapt what that, uh, that value really is and looks like. But it also gives us the control, discipline, and restrictions to say it's, it's the customer's value in particular, which means they need to be intrinsically involved in a lot of these decisions. It's not just, well, you know, here's your scope. Thank you, customer. We'll come and see you in a, you know, six months' time when it's done. With an agile project, the customer is there every month, every couple of weeks, every other week. So whatever's going on, it's in that cycle the iterative cycle because they're the ones that decide what value is and they can and they will change their mind in an agile project they're meant to be able to change their mind in fact it's often seen as a good thing because agile looks at it this way let's say a customer halfway through a project says that's not what we, what we want that's not looking like it's going to be the thing we need we're going to do something a little bit different can we morph it into this somehow now, one perspective is to say, what a waste. Another perspective is to say, well, if we hadn't done that, the customer wouldn't have had this revelation to say, now I know what I want. So it's not a waste. It's an investment in the exploration to help a customer know what they really need. So Agile says, well, yes, of course we can adapt. And it's a good thing that we did because if we just kept going, we would have delivered something at the end that had even less chance and had even less value for what you wanted. And we've all done those projects, right? We've all been in those projects where halfway through, we're looking at it 
and we're saying, you know, this thing that we're building by the time it's done, it's not going to be, there's not going to be a round of applause. We've seen that happen. That's what agile was invented to help address. So the value, when's it most at risk? When we don't know what it's meant to be yet, or when we don't know whether or not it can be achieved yet. So what the plan does, a plan, planning based projects, it manages the value that we can predict. And that's all it can manage. If you can't predict the value, you can't plan for it. But having a, a vision that's loosely defined and then continues to get refined stage by stage, iteration by iteration, and adapting what you're doing to that end vision as it evolves, that manages the empirical value, the value that you're discovering along the way. And it lets you adapt where you're applying your resources along the way so that you increasingly deliver something that's closer and closer to what's asked for or what we actually need. Warren Buffett, uh, most people would know the name, very uh, successful, rich investor says, price is what you pay, value is what you get. It's the result. So we all know a bit about how planning works. We use planning all the time. Uh, we've all heard of the 80-20 rule. You know, we know this, this concept exists. It's a, bit, it's a bit vague and it's a bit unfair. It doesn't really apply in that strict sense. But we know that there's this idea that uh, a lot of our result can come from a smaller portion of our efforts. Right? The 80-20 rule kind of says, if you think about it in terms of projects, well, 80% of our result comes from 20% of our work. It's never really like that. But the idea that a small proportion of our effort delivers a larger proportion of the result, that's where Agile shines and gives us strength because we can maximize that. In a waterfall, in plan-based methodology, the planning and the execution, they're disconnected. In Agile, they're not necessarily disconnected anymore. But because we plan things very close to when we do it, the cycle of plan execute gets tighter. So it's not a disconnected. Planning isn't disconnected from the activity. In fact, the same people that do the activity take an active role in the planning of that activity because they have the best knowledge, the best information. Now, I mentioned before plans and planning, different things. Planning, we can think of it as preliminary decision making. Even when we don't lock in the decision, we might still think about it, discuss it, consider what could be, and then park that and make a more detailed decision later because we've identified things that are missing. So we're not yet able to lock in a decision, but we may have identified things that we can predict, and that could be dependencies, infrastructure that we need, equipment that we need, fundamental components like a database that we need, things that we know we need in advance, we've gained from that preliminary decision-making, some degree of early planning. So it's not either or, it's not you either plan everything or you plan nothing. It's not at all like that. You plan everything you can. You plan to decide to discover what you have to decide later and discover what you have to decide now. So you get the idea of derived planning versus original planning. If you're building a bridge, you're probably operating on an original plan most of the way through. If you're doing with, dealing with IT, you often start with an original plan. If you want to change that, you're still going by a plan. Even if you're agile, even if you're scrum, you're cycling through iterations, you still have a plan, but it's today's plan. It's this week's plan. It's this sprint plan. And it started from all the decisions that were made earlier. And the decisions that have since been deemed appropriate to be changed have been changed. It's a maturing of the plan. So what gives Agile its control over success? What gives Agile its ability to get the right result is this, this close tightness between the execution of activities and the planning of those activities. And it's that close knit tightness that gives the freedom to say, what we're gonna do next is what we've decided upon with the best and latest information but it also brings the expectation that that decision has to be the best decision we could make because there is no excuse. 
There is no excuse for not doing absolutely the right thing next because there's no better way to decide upon it. So that's where Agile gets its control from the fact that it's always going to be able to and expected to make the best decisions possible. Value above success in terms, value is success from an Agile's point of view. And Einstein felt similarly, although maybe he had a different context. So I've mentioned iterations, I've mentioned iterative development. You often develop iteratively based on a fixed period of time called a time box. In Scrum, we call it a sprint. In IT, it's usually measured in a number of weeks. You're normally including in those time boxes activities that are defined based on the feature, based on what it's going to do. So everything gets done incrementally on this cyclic basis. So you get some things that have worked on concurrently and some things that are worked on in series. Some things need to be done after the other. When you are doing things iteratively, you're learning your lessons but you're applying those lessons in two weeks time or whatever the next time box, whatever the next sprint is, you're not able to apply those lessons. You're expected to apply those lessons. And if you're not applying the lessons that you learned last week, when you're deciding what to do next week, if you're not doing that, you're not doing agile properly because that's what it expects of you. So this means we are dependent upon a feedback loop a feedback loop where the customer gives feedback as to the value that's being created bit by bit. That means that this is the reason why we deliver based on features. Because what we deliver, every sprint, every sequence, every iteration, must be something the customer can recognize. It must be something that they can value, they can understand. A few lines of code that, or, or half a thing that doesn't quite do anything that's not discernible or measurable from a customer's point of view in terms of value. It needs to be something they can value and measure at the end of every feedback loop. So we're doing micro planning. We are planning, making all the same decisions just in microscopic increments. So this means it's the team. The team are making the decisions, the people are making the decisions about what are we gonna do in this sprint? based on everything we've just learned about what happened in the last one, what are we gonna do in the next one? We take all the input. What this allows for is new things. If we compromise, you polarize the views and you try and meet in the middle. But if you allow things to be reconceived, you have new possibilities. You get to say, okay, we were gonna do this, but we've now created the opportunity for someone to say, hang on, with all this extra information, what if we did this instead? And then the product owner might say, well, no, the, that's not what the customer wanted. And then, well, let's ask them if they would want that because maybe they didn't even know we could. So when we have an alignment between members of the team, between the people creating and the people enjoying, that gives us a context that means that all of these decisions can be made in alignment. Everyone can view these details from the same point of view, the same perspective. And then you don't just have clever people, but even if you don't have above average clever people, if you just have the same people you have today, what you get is more clever interactions because they're talking about the absolute latest thing with the absolute latest knowledge, including the customer who is unavoidably and intrinsically a member of the team. So in an agile environment, the team is the project. And if we are a leader of an agile team, or if we're the leader of a team who have some engagement with agile, that's something we need to be able to work with. We need to be able to help people, whether they are planists or reactivists, to function, find their feet and work in the environment that means that they are encouraged to contribute and expected to contribute. I've got an interesting question just on that slide, if we could go back to it, I think maybe at least tangentially related. This is from yep. Ibukunaloa. Uh, sorry if the pronunciation was wrong. Um, what I have found with IT projects run on Agile 
is the complexity of the outcomes due to the frequent changes in volatility. How can complexity be reduced? Is this sort of team decision-making process something that reduces the complexity or, or at least uh, accounts for it? Uh, the complexity generally comes from the number of connecting points. So complexity, uh, if you to, to look at the word, it, it talks about the number of ways in which things influence things. And yes, IT projects are often highly complex because of that simple fact. One thing can affect many things. And you can reduce complexity by compartmentalizing things. Compartmentalizing things. So I talked about, and, and we'll talk about, and I'm going to pull this up because this, this thing here, the product backlog, feeds into this question. The product backlog is the everything we haven't done yet. And it's this big thing over here that's kind of like the rest of the project. And yet we've got this sprint and let's say it's a couple of weeks and we're talking about what to do that. But the complexity problem comes from how do we make sure that what we do in this sprint works neatly with what we're gonna do in six sprints time. That's where you get a strategic breakdown of the product backlog. And that's where you say, well, we're going to do the sprints based on features, but we're going to have a group of sprints based on capability. So if you're talking about software, let's talk about CRM software, right? We're, we're customizing CRM software. So imagine that a lot of the features that are getting done are gonna be like reporting, it's gonna be uh, things that the software can do, things that it can do. But we might then as a set of capabilities say, well, let's do all of the features that fall into the sales teams area. And then we'll do all of the features where the finance team need to think about it. And yeah, there might be some overlap, but by strategically organizing the outcomes and the value, we can separate some of the complexity that would otherwise trip us up. It doesn't stop it from being complex, but what it does is it gives us a way of saying, well, now we know where some of the more intense interactions that cause complexity can come from. And if we can focus and get the people in it, because when the people that are involved have it top of mind, when it's in our heads, the complexity is easier to manage. Where the complexity often does us damage is when we've forgotten a lot of those nuances, a lot of those connection points, a lot of those interesting things. So the timing of when we do things to align the complexity together is one of the ways that Agile addresses that point. Now, not sure if that's gonna solve the problem that uh, uh, the, um, our audience members talked about, but that's the method that Agile would use. Thanks a lot. Was that the only question you, you wanted to throw in? There yeah, I just time? wanted, uh, that, that one particularly. Um, and and I'll, I'll, okay. I'll talk about a, a, a chat message that just came from Camille a little while ago. This latest chat really drives home last week's discussion about how IT service management really needs to involve and, and make responsible all parts of any business. Yes. Um, I mean, the complexity question leads into that as well, because the complexity is always going to be there, but it's less painful when we can cross the bridges, cross the boundaries, cross over the gaps. When uh, coding crosses over into the hardware uh, when and both of those cross over into the customer and the users and all those barriers come down, complexity is less dangerous. And IT is always going to be complex. Let's look at the scrum role. So they go back a step. This is the scrum components. They're sprints. They are short. There is a sprint planning at the beginning of every sprint where you decide and people have to have buy-in, the team that's producing so, well, this is what we think we can do in the next two weeks. Then at the end of every sprint, first you look back, would you get the customer's feedback? Then you look at, well, how well did we do that? What lessons can we learn about how we should do our next sprint a little differently? And then we plan the next one and we eat away at the product backlog. The roles we have is you have a scrum master who is a person who is essentially responsible for the way in which the activities take place. The Scrum Master is the 
has a supervisory role to ensure that the way in which everyone conducts their day, conducts their week and their sprint and their business, they're accountable for the, the how. You have a product owner that is accountable for the value and the result, the liaison with the customer, ensuring that the value viewpoint is represented. And you have the team who are the ones building and doing things. Now, one of the most common questions that comes out of this was, well, wait, hang on, who's the project manager? Which, which, which one is the project manager? Right, who's, result, who, who's responsible for that? I'm going to tell you and suggest to you that you can have that as a separate role, although you may have it on one of the other hats. You generally have with the project manager a degree of accountability that these two don't have. And that is, what about the economic viability of the team. So often the scrum master is responsible for efficiency. Often the product owner is responsible for outcome and making sure that that gets paid for. But someone has to make sure that what the team is doing is economically viable to continue doing. So you've got one question that says, customers saying, well, I'm spending money on this every sprint. Am I getting value back for that? How do I evolve that value so that I, it's more like what I want? But then you have a delivery economic perspective that says, are we making enough money out of what we're doing? Are we charging enough? Are we productive enough that we can be sustainable from that point of view? And yeah, then that, that role might sit overlap with some of the others, but it's a different perspective that needs to be taken into account. And that's why it's a slightly different color because it's often not technically considered a regular scrum role. So the delivery model in simple terms is we envision something. The vision statement is where as much of the customer's input about what they think they want is gained, but it's often usually only a couple of pages. It's not a big document. It's something to aim for. It's the goalposts at the end. Then you had the speculate phase where you thought, what could we do? Is this going to work? And you spend some time and you build some stuff. You speculate. That's kind of like the initial planning of a sprint. And then you explore that by building it. Right? We're going to do these features. And you then take that to the customer at the end of the sprint and say, is this what you want? And sometimes a customer will say, yes, that is what I want. Great. Or they'll say, no, almost. Can you take it back and do this to it and make this a little bit, yeah, okay, we can do that. That's the adapt part. And so then we go back to, right, let's plan what we can do next to it. Explore is, explore is a, another word for build, build with uncertainty. Adapt is what we do once we've gotten the feedback. So this is our iteration. This goes on forever. Envision happens once, but it does evolve each time we get the feedback. At the end, we're done. So it's, it's just these three steps that go round and round and round. So this is the, the fundamental model of what we're dealing with. The principles we work with. And when I talk about principles, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, I, I would encourage you to read the Agile Manifesto. There's a link to it. Uh, there's also another link. There's also another thing called the Declaration of Interdependence. Both of them are a, a list of points that give the idea of what it's really all about. Keeping in mind the Agile Manifesto is a little dated now because its wording is based on its origins, which is very much in the software mindset. So the principles of practice, uh, we are simple about what we do. The practices are the activities we do, how we do things, generally simple. It's generally not meant to be prescriptive. It's meant to be generative. It's meant to bring results. It needs to be aligned with the agile mentality of making our decisions later with the best info. And it's focused on delivering value, not focused on meeting a specification, not complying with decisions that were made a long time ago. We're doing just enough at each stage in order to make the decision. We're doing just enough to get a result, just enough to show the customer but by just enough, I mean really enough. Everything is just enough because we don't overdo something because we don't yet know whether that's worth doing. And the 
team dynamics means that there's meant to be mutual support. There's a lot of uncertainty even within a sprint. You know, you've got two different people working in their sprint and one might finish their work a little earlier, a little easier because it was easier than they expected. And someone else has bitten off more than they can chew and they need that extra assistance. And this is what the scrum master is involved in with the product owner. Sometimes during a sprint, halfway through the sprint, you think we're not gonna get everything done. How do we decide what gets left off? Well, what you don't do is end up with 20 different user stories that are all half done because there's nothing to show the customer. You might say, well, let's get these 10 done and we can at least get them shown and get feedback on them at the end. So the way we go about things is about being effective. It's not about what's the best way to do this. The best way to do that is whatever is works best today. Scrum has stories. I mentioned a moment ago, user stories. Uh, you have a user story that is simply the user's perspective of what they want. It's a user's wording to describe the result they need. But you also have technical stories. That's, that does have specifications. That does have, and this is usually created by the experts, the technical creating experts that say, well, you, we're gonna need this. We're gonna need this kind of database. We're gonna need, th the field is gonna have to be this big. It's gonna have to be 144 characters long if you want this or whatever the case may be. There are technical works that need to be done. The product backlog is just all of them combined that we haven't done yet. The iterations, that's what is full of stories. User stories are the parcels of work that get done in a sprint. And when you take work on in a sprint, you take on user stories intended to be completed by the end of that sprint. Now, occasionally you get user stories that are too big for that and they do get split. But the intention usually is you wanna get user stories done within a sprint. And that often is what's gonna determine how long your sprint should be for your project. Then you have the release plan. Now, I mentioned before when the question came up about complexity, by structuring the entire project in a more macroscopic strategic scale, that's what the release plan is all about. It is not nearly 25 sprints that all just happen to happen. We will break those up into a release plan that says, well, after six sprints, we're gonna have this much capability done. And after another six, we're gonna have this. And that's the strategic decision-making that gets done at the very beginning. Now, if you might say, well, hang on, I thought you said that we don't know enough yet. Sometimes you have what's called a sprint zero and you don't deliver anything at the end of sprint zero. But what you do is get answers to the most important fundamental questions. The things that really are significant to the planning of the earliest stages, that's the stuff you might exploratory do at the very beginning. And you still get paid for that. That's, that's like R&D. But it might need to be done if you have great uncertainty about what to do, like if you've never done it before. Now, all of this and the idea of the release plan leans into what do you do if it's even bigger? I mean, if you have half a dozen people, or a dozen, 15 in a scrum team, that's kind of normal. But what if you have like 30, 50, 100? What if the project is really big and you still want to be able to have flexibility? That's where instead of having a release plan, you have what's called a value stream. And that's what larger frameworks bring this little extra thing on top. And SAFE is an example of what does that. You use Agile to deploy stages of the project. So we're still working with the Agile manifesto. We're still working with those fundamental principles. We use systems thinking because even in a large scale project, things affect other things. So we still have a phenomenon where everything comes together periodically. In the same way that in Scrum, at the end of every sprint, the entire team will get together in a room 
or a, in a digital room now, as it may be, but the entire team will be in one meeting. Sounds chaotic. In large scale, safe oriented, agile, you still do the same thing. You still have at the end of maybe three or four sprints, you'll have a point where all the different sprint teams will get together or they will have a day or two where they do all their combined planning because all of the interactions are necessary. That's where you get the team over here that's just working on this database thing and the team over here that's working on UI, they can't remain separate from each other for the entirety of the project because something will fall through the cracks. So no matter how big it gets, you still get those people in a room to hash out their issues and come up with their new ideas. And it also means that we are trying to reduce wastage, which is a lean component about minimizing wastage, which is you know, lean is contributed to the agile mindset because agility is also about, let's not waste time on something we shouldn't be doing because we're able to decide what we should be doing. So primary elements uh, of what SAFE is all about, it creates a framework that sits above the scrum. It sits above a single team and it brings those team together. So it's like a scrum of scrums. It means that the system is bigger and more important than the individual components. It creates a hierarchy that says, okay, decisions that are going to be made between the teams or between the individual components have a point of overlap where they can influence each other. And it addresses those points of interconnect. It addresses the complexity, which is the question that was raised before. By creating clearly defined moments, where we have to get together and resolve the points where something bumps something else or will in the next run. So it creates this conduit from the very top of the decision-making all the way down. And we call it a value stream because it doesn't ever really need to end. A scrum project will produce a thing typically. And when that thing is there, usually that project is done. A value stream doesn't necessarily need to work that way because a value stream might be producing a number of scrum projects. And once you've done that, over a period of time, and it could be many months, years, two years, three, there'll be new things coming in the pipeline that we'll still work on. So this is a mentality, a way of saying, well, we're going to adaptively, iteratively, empirically develop what we do towards a moving target that's always moving for us across the entire IT department, across the entire company value, goals, success, moving target. How are we going to adapt to that? This is where you get things like agile management, agile leadership, agile decision-making, because it starts to impact everything that happens at the very top, at the executive level. So the one thing that SAFE brings, the component, they call it the release train. And it's, it's essentially a value stream. It's essentially a way of structuring how and when Scrum teams get together. And it does assume that you're using something like Scrum at the small component level. So it's a way of saying, well, how do we structurally make planning decisions, make complexity decisions, make systems decisions at the points of interconnect? It's what handles the release planning. It's the thing that says, right, this team, you got this capability to produce and you know you've got four sprints to do that much and they're on board with that because they have to then say well we're going to agree to take this on and they could turn around and say no we can't we won't it's not going to be right that's what just like in a sprint planning where the individual people decide what they can take on in the next sprint that team will decide what they take on in the next release train of X number of sprints. And there is a lot of hashing out disagreements 
And one of the reasons why it all gets done in a day and a half or in a day or so is because there has to be a time limit. There has to be that time pressure to actually bring a solution and get the results made clear. So there has to be a way of saying, well, we've got to get an answer so we could all go home at some point or log off as the case may be. So from a leadership point of view, this is the kind of mechanism. We don't need to have 100 people in order to implement the idea behind value streams or release trains, where we are taking a strategic perspective on managing the large scale points of interconnect. And that's when you get things like, okay, the scrum team is doing the very technical things and they've had a few sprints. And then we say, well, let's get executive leadership involved. Let's get the other major stakeholders involved whose time might be difficult to bring them in every sprint, but we can bring them in every so often structurally so that they're expected to be there. And no, they can't reschedule it because there's 25 other people that are going to be there on that day. And so they really need to be as well. And I put this slide in twice. There we go. We get to see it twice. So I'm going to draw out some of the synergies and then we're going to tackle some of these questions. Uh, and I'm sure people are going to have lots of questions uh, from this tonight. The synergies. Where does agile and service management work together? I actually believe that IT service management is intrinsically agile in nature. They are the area of IT that is the most adaptive and the most reactive. They are dealing with unknowns every day. That's They live and breathe unknowns. Who knows what's going to fall over tomorrow? So because it's inherently empirical and discovery, it is inherently agile. Now, one of the questions I spotted there before, which I'm going to, I'm its question, I'm going to, I'm going to throw this in here because it's relevant. The difference between empirical and innovation. Empirical is simply something that you explore and can't predict, but you may not be using it to create something new. Tech support is empirical, but it's not innovative. Tech support is reactive, but yet it's discovery. It's what are we going to have to solve today? Not only that, IT service management has to service all the things that agile projects have delivered. Agile and business analysis. Now, this is interesting. And some of this will become uh, more relevant when we talk about it next week. Business analysis was born out of an attempt to make waterfall more effective at these scary unknown IT projects where we waste all our money because we thought we knew what we wanted and when we get that big, it's not what we wanted. So one of the solutions to that was, hey, business analysis, let's, let's double down on planning. Let's get every possible question asked and answered and then we'll be right. But then we'll know what to do. That's what business analysis began as. Does that mean it's redundant now? Absolutely not. Because business analysis is the process of asking the questions that we need the answers to. It's absolutely as relevant in Agile as it is in Waterfall. It just happens differently at a different time. Business analysis happens every single sprint. In Waterfall, it happens at the very beginning. How does Agile and governance link together? Go <clears throat> governance is about certainty. Governance is about making sure of pretty much everything or everything that, that needs to be made sure. So it's things like risk. Governance is also about delivering value. So governance uses agile or agility as a way of minimizing the risks of the unknown by having an effective decision-making methodology that lets us get the best result out of what we don't yet know. So Agile works as a tool, an instrument of governance, where governance says, here's a billion dollars, go and start this business and do all these great things with it, deliver all this wonderful value. Some of that is going to have to be done in an Agile manner because we don't know exactly what that's going to look like yet. Governance enjoys that, the fact that Agile can do that. Because if governance didn't have Agile and only had 
plan-based waterfall as a solution, there'd be more wastage and there'd be more loss. Now, some of that is gonna make more sense when we get to the subsequent weeks, next week and the week after. Guy, what have we got with questions? Thank goodness for that. Uh, <laughs> I need to listen to this one again. Um, yeah, huge. We have, of course, several questions. I'll, um, I'll get Hannah to cut them off now because um, we're already on time, um, which is fine by me. I love that, the hour lecture and the, the longer um, uh, Q&A session. Um, all righty, let's just go from the top because um, I haven't seen any that actually jump straight out. Actually, one I wanted to start with from earlier, Angela Diaz. Why would you say value or the value is subjective? I think it has to be related to a SMART goal. In that way, it wouldn't be subjective. I'm confused. Uh, so it, it, it needs to be clarified so that it can be understood. But it's subjective because it's going to be measured by what the humans value at that time. And it's going to be decided by human beings who are making the decisions they need to make with the latest information that they have and the latest opinions and the latest reactions. So remember, the feedback loop is customers involved or the users even, select users, perhaps the ones that are most relevant to the user stories that are getting created. We recognize the fact that it's human beings making that decision. Because it's not a scope that you can clearly say, here's the specs and, and here's what we've built. Do they match up? Because we can't do that quite as easily, what you get is a, a user that sits in front of a perhaps a screen and is demonstrated, okay, this is how you do it. This is this is what works. And you click here and this is is that what you wanted? Is that will that work? Will that do what you need? So you inevitably have that subjectivity that says, well, a person or persons are then deciding whether that's value. Because it's not based on a strict predetermined set of criteria that you can measure absolutely. That's the that's what I meant when I said that that value was subjective. Thank you. Uh, got a couple of questions that are linked um, from Carol and Michael. How do you budget for agile projects where you know the result is possibly always changing? And Michael, how do you quote a project based on this approach? So you budget based on the vision and you quote based on the vision as a starting point. Uh, you also, when well, you quote based on the vision, you budget based on the, uh, the, the parameters, the restrictions. Sometimes a customer will say, I need this result. And, you know, well, I, I won't say I don't care what it costs because I, I will care, uh, but the result is more important. Sometimes they will say, I, I've got this much money or I've got this amount of time and I need the best result we can get for that much money and that much time. And at some point, the question is, well, is that even possible? Can we do that? And if the answer is yes, then your budget is, is largely fixed. And what the variable becomes is, well, what, how much value can we get for that much money and time? That's what I recently did. I, I built an app and, you know, I said to the development team that I'm working with, I said, well, yeah, this is my budget because it's just me. Uh, what can we do for that? And we went through that and it took a day and we went through a planning and I got to the end thinking, well, yeah, I can get most of the features that I need and they'll be, they'll be cut down, they'll be simplified. And at the end of the project, six months later, I didn't get all the features that I wanted, but I got a few other things that I discovered I wanted along the way. So the quote is time. You're quoting for the resources that get invested. They quoted me, well, you know, it's this many programming hours. It's, it's, it's this much activity. And then the question is managing it sprint by sprint to make sure that what I'm getting is worth it. Now, at some point, I may have decided, actually, what I want is going to cost me twice as much. Is that their fault? No. Is it my fault? No. It's just what it is. Now, the more experienced we are at doing this kind of work, the easier it will be for us to have a good idea as to what you can get done with a budget. If it's absolutely the first time and we just don't know, then that's something we express to the customer. And we say, well, there's going to have to be an agreement that some of this investment 
is just based on discovery. It's just figuring it out. And that's an understanding that needs to be reached in the vision stage where we say, okay, you want to do that? Really? Well, that's not been done before. So let's look at what we need to do and what you need to pay for in order to figure that out. So you break that down and say, okay, and you might have a, you might have a, a go or no go gateway that happens after a couple of sprints, because at that point, you know, whether or not it's even feasible to reach the vision statement within the budget and time frame allowed. Thank you. A couple of quick ones and then a, a longer discussion one from Hugh, um, who wanted to change his vote uh, earlier, Hugh Bryant. Uh, oh, a quick quote from that, uh, from the chat. Uh, with regards to the uh, the two polls earlier, Aaron was saying uh, anyone who voted planist uh, at the start and then changed their vote to reactivist is in fact a reactivist. So thank you, Aaron. That was very nice. Well played. Uh, best comment of the night. Intrinsically, yes. <laughs> uh, but Hugh wonders a planist and reactivist actual agile terms, and if not, should they be? And should you, I don't know, contact them and maybe, I don't know, get some kind of. Um, they're in. not. I, I use them. I use them all the time. I, I use it to, to convey the idea because Agile doesn't really care about the psychology of who's involved, but IT leadership does. That's totally mm. IT leadership's problem. And no, you don't find that an answer to that in the Scrum Handbook. So we've, we've got to answer that some other way. And, and this is a way of defining what the problem is or, or what it looks like so that we can find some solution from that point of view. But it is a leadership kind of problem. So I don't know if if Agile, if, if any training program is going to want to do it. But in our subject, in ITE 518, it's a master's level university subject. So we do everything. We cover all aspects of it, including the psychology. Wonderful. We get to do that. You do that in a lot of your subjects, actually. It's quite interesting. Mm. Uh, yeah. Steve well, was the why. Sorry, the, the why. why. Yeah. Mm. Steve wonders: uh, Do the iterative cycles for an agile project need to be the same length of time? For example, you know, month-long sprints, or can they be? You know, doesn't sound very agile, actually. But if, <laughs> um, well, it, it's it, it's interesting when you say, well, hang on, can't they just be whatever length we want? Wouldn't that be more agile? Well, actually, no. That's one of the things that is generally fairly tight. Mm. And I say generally because you know, I have seen exceptions. Um, I, I have seen, a, it's, it's generally a rhythm though, right? So what, what I've seen done is at the beginning of uh, a program implement uh, increment or the beginning of, a, of, a, of a, a release train, which might be four sprints or something like that, right? Sometimes I've seen the first sprint have an extra week in it. It's still a rhythm. It's, it's always that though. Hmm. Uh, but generally the answer is yes, it's nearly always the same. And the rhythm creates a predictability of workflow management because one of the most important decisions that the team members are making is at the beginning of the sprint planning of every sprint, what can you get done out of this black log in the next sprint? And if you have the same period of time each time, that's a lot easier for that question to be accurately answered. Mm -hmm. If you change the length of the sprint too much, you lose that ability to be clear. And then you get people that take on too much, don't take on enough. That's when it gets a bit tricky. So that's why. Thanks a lot. Uh, Derek asks a question that might be more relevant to the scalable part of the, the uh, lecture. Uh, how do you interact with the rest of an organization who is not agile? And we were talking a lot about I guess, uh, interaction between departments um, last week with ITSM and mm -hmm. ITIL. Well, if they're the customer or the, they have a customer relationship, then obviously even at the scrum level, there's a role for them in the feedback loop because at the end of every sprint, uh, there is the sprint review, which is the customer's judgment on everything that's been done. Now, there might be another department that's the customer. And even if they're not the core customer, they, they might still have some in, interaction where they, if their feedback is valuable, they're a customer because they're a stakeholder from a customer's point of view, even if they're not paying for it. So there'll be a point in time when their input is valuable and it'll depend upon what's being done. But 
the systems thinking element of, as you pointed out, what safe and uh, value streams look at, the systems thinking means that if there might be feedback from another department, and we don't know if there is or should be, that's what the periodical gathering is meant to discover. We don't just assume that because we, with our technical hat on, we can't see a need for someone over there to give us their feedback. That doesn't mean that's right. And that doesn't mean that we rely on that because Agile, we want the absolute best decision. So we will create a cyclic opportunity for the interconnectedness to take place so that other departments, other stakeholders, and they're expected to turn up and they're expected to, to, to be able to spend time, to focus, pay attention, decide, is there a point of need to connect? Can I offer feedback? Is there something useful to share and discuss? So Thank yes, it, that's the system. That's the method. That's the reasoning. Thank you. Uh, we led off tonight with a question about the difference between IT project management and project management, and it was uncertainty and perhaps to some extent complexity. Um, Eric was asking, what's the difference between project management and product uh, project management and product management. And then there's a related question um, uh, from JM, who in, in JM's experience, Agile works best in product development. How can we fit in Agile delivery in fixed project engagements where there is a, a fixed budget? So it's a good point because Agile began out of product delivery. It very much that's where it started. And for a lot of organizations, that's where it still is. And Yes, that's where its strength lies. And that's what a lot of people are familiar with. And Agile would be focused around a product because the vision is usually focused around a product, a discernible, definable thing. And when you have a discernible, definable thing, that's, that's what it is, that's usually the definition of a product. And we might also call it a project because the definition of a product is, you know, an endeavor uh, that has a start has a finish has a thing that comes out of that both uh both labels apply but sometimes you have a project that's bigger than any one product in that sense you have project management is the viability of all of the other elements that need to deliver the greater capability and i use the cap the word capability quite specifically because Capability is the ability to convert whatever it is that's been created to deliver secondary value by someone else. Someone's going to use that and they're going to do their thing with that. And that's capability. It's the capability that they gain to do their thing more, better, differently, etc. So if that's more than just the product, that's the role of project management to say, and, and sometimes, you know, what I'm talking about when it's big enough goes beyond project management, starts to become program management. And that's when you're in the realm of safe and value streams and big projects where there's lots of different teams doing lots of different things. Something has to bring it all together. And that's what program and ultimately portfolio management does. So you could say that product management is a step underneath that. But you can also go another way and say, well, hang on, a product often has a life cycle that is longer than any one project. A product might have iterations itself. It might come back next year and get worked on again. Our courses do that, right? So this course, this ITE 518, it's been redeveloped three times and literally completely redeveloped, like most of it redone and re rewritten and, and recreated. That's uh, another product development, but the product is still living on in some way. So there's no rule that says this is how it's got to work and this is how it's got to be structured. What the rules are is know what the pros and cons are. Know what your situation is and what works for you and make sure nothing falls through the gaps. If you need project management, use it in that way. How many of does those that, rewrites were you? I think so. If not, they can uh, ask for clarification. But... 
I went well, all of them because all of them. Yes. Yeah, I yes. I started it, and but that's what happens, right? They, these these subjects come back to me every couple of years for a refresh. Yeah, and and out of that, uh, and out of that, we we sort of feed into maybe we'll do different subjects like program management. You yeah. know, yeah. So uh, with that with that sort of um, uh, link closely with the safe methodology or or, or framework. Yeah, that's that's value streaming, right? Because the value stream is the range of courses that contribute to the qualifications that CSU offers and that uh, IT Masters is, is contributing to. So the value stream is the course. And courses uh, and subjects come in and drop off that value stream, depending on interest, depending on change in society and technology, right? Agile wasn't there always. It's, it's, it's been there for a few years, but it wasn't always there. We've got others that have been added uh, at different stages that's the value stream at work another subject you've uh, talked about uh, is um oh what is it digital social selling and and the the way yeah. you, you you deal with people and camille has a really interesting comment on that with respect to the 80 20 rule uh, perhaps we consider that a good project manager spends more time over the course of a project managing stakeholders Managing people rather than schedules often reveals insights, uh, learnings, agility, and, and uh, wrestles the emotive stakeholder back towards the value being created for the end user and customer. Would you agree or have any comments? I, I would. I would. I, the, the, the extra thing I would add to that is to say that within the Scrum model in particular, some of those interactions with the customer are particularly intense and there is a dedicated role and expectation with the product owner to be the representative of the customer on the inside and, and to the customer on, on, on the outside of the team. And so you often have someone with the customer's hat on in that role in an intense way, but that's, they're not the only stakeholder. So uh, the point is valid to say that, well, yes, all of the other stakeholders, who's going to worry about who, the, the, the executive, the finance team, the HR department, who's going to handle those stakeholders and keep them off the scrum master's back, project management has a role there. So I agree, I agree with that principle. I think it is a valid point. Thank you. Uh, so Shadri uh, is asking, people talk about the Spotify model in terms of agile project management. Um, are there other organizations who have successfully implemented the Spotify model? Can you think of any other uh, people who, or organizations that push it and, and really, uh, I guess vocalize it. Um, the, 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 so the Spotify model, they, they have their own release train model. Uh, one of the things I heard quite some while, a while ago actually is that um, Facebook uh, uh, does two software pushes a day. They, they, they have two releases every day, or maybe they do more now. This was a while ago, it was a couple of years ago. But you know, as, as an organization, as IT delivery, they pushed out changes to their code twice a day. Uh, what does it take to deliver that? Uh, it's astounding to me that, that, that they have that sort of smooth delivery, that they can be ready to go live with code on something that's used by billions every 12 hours or something. Um, and what I think happens is that the Spotify model is an example of a model. And what works is generally whatever people in the environment are mostly familiar with. And you look at things like SAFE, which is a large scale model, it's a, it's a framework. It's just the bones of a framework. And it tells you what you need to consider, but there's a lot of flexibility as to how you adapt it. And then you look at all the other agile ideas like Kanban and Lean and things like that. They've all evolved and they all have a myriad of different ways of doing it. Uh, so I'm not intricately familiar with the Spotify model. I'm not aware of it being championed and used uh, by other organizations to say, hey, we'll do that. Uh, but I tell you what did happen to Lean. Lean was invented back in the 80s uh, by, by uh, Toyota. I think it was Toyota. Yeah, I think it was Toyota. Uh, Japanese car manufacturer. Uh, trying to reduce the wastage in the production line. And their way of doing that actually did get copied a lot. But then so did Henry Ford's way right? 
they begin as a, well, here's a great example. We've solved some problems. We've got some answers and people copy that either in peace or if they're starting out, maybe they'll just copy the whole thing from scratch. But I haven't heard it being pushed and taught in that way. On Facebook, uh, in the chat, we've got two interpretations. One from Hamish, who's who's had a couple of crackers in the chat tonight. Um, Facebook's code is so bad that they need to fix it twice a day. Uh, <laughs> and and uh, Mickey saying, no, they're honest enough to admit that they need to fix it. Uh, others are maybe not so honest. Uh, uh, yeah. Thanks, both. I heard a similar thing. It has to be twice a day because wants to break it, then wants to fix it, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's another cynical perspective. Um, and look, we, we, we know that with high speed pushes of code, it's not all perfect. Um, but if you're, if you're making changes twice a day, you've got a pretty quick opportunity to fix what you just broke, if you broke something. Joko asks, will Agile fit on legacy systems? Are there other issues to consider there? Um, I think that's a it's it's a broad question because uh, I guess it depends on the legacy system. I, I think less so, because with legacy systems, a lot of the decisions, a lot of the the questions have already been answered, and there's a lot of knowns. Uh, we we know how things happen. Uh, the only thing I would say as a as a tail on that is that legacy systems, if they are vulnerable if they're weak and uncertain and they fall over regularly and they fall over for reasons that they shouldn't because they're legacy and they're, you know, they're old and long in the tooth, then agility in response. But that's, that's saying, well, that's agile tech support, right? Uh, maybe, but I, I wouldn't say necessarily because they're legacy. I would say that maybe because they are vulnerable and they're vulnerable to unknowns. Uh, and it's simply for that reason that maybe they're more suitable. Uh, or suitable for agile, but often perhaps not. Uh, often with legacy systems, you change as little as possible. Thank you. Certainly that's my experience. A few questions just on, on, I guess, on Scrum particulars. Tracy asks, can one person be both Scrum Master and a project manager? Uh, you could be Scrum Master and project manager. You cannot be Scrum Master and product owner. Uh, ah, well, that answers Nuruddin's question. Then. Right. So you, 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 well, you can't, you shouldn't. According to the Scrum model, you should not have a person who is both Scrum Master and Product Owner because those two roles are in tension. Because the Scrum Master represents the team, administers the team, controls the team, but also represents the team. And the Product Owner represents the customer. Hmm. And there's, there's meant to, to be... Uh, differing viewpoints and they're meant to be in, in tension and that tension gets resolved at every sprint uh, periodically. So you don't want the same person because they will lean one way or the other and that will cause damage to the value. Thank you. Uh, Amit uh, asks, can we have multiple sprints simultaneously? Um, can they overlap? Absolutely you do if you, that's what SAFE does. Uh, if you have multiple sprints, if you have multiple teams, if you have enough people doing doing things, it, it, it depends how big. If you want to have 12 people, it's really one sprint. And maybe you've got half a dozen doing this and half a dozen doing that. And mm. they, don't, they don't cross over much. Um, that can happen, but that's still really probably one sprint. But if you have 30 people, then those you might have teams that have very little reason to interact throughout most of their sprint. Uh, in that situation, you would say, okay, we've got two different sprints and we have two different sprint planning. It really comes down to the planning. Do you need all of them in the room every sprint? If the answer is no, because what they're doing is sufficiently separate, then maybe they are a separate sprint if it's a separate sprint planning and review. And if you have that, you need some other mechanism to bring it together at the top and make sure that whatever they're working on each sprint still aligns and joins up to the bigger picture. So you need then the release train, the value stream. You need the periodical every few sprints. We actually do get them all together and hash things out and share. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I've seen two. I've seen I've seen examples where two running together is still that's still safe. That's still an agile a release train. Hmm. Thanks. 
Shuhail asks, is agile methodology appropriate for a nonprofit organization? Are there any, or perhaps we can say, is there anywhere where it's just uh, completely out of the question? I know you're talking about, you know, the, the bridge model or the bridge idea before. Um, I, I'd say no, because I, I don't, I don't, I, 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 is it, is it appropriate? Uh, yes, it's appropriate. Is there anywhere where it's not appropriate? No, because I feel that the conditions that make it suitable or not is dependent upon your ability to define the value and architecture. You can define things clearly enough and, and other types of outputs when you can define it. Absolutely then there's less need. It's a case of whether or not it's empirical. So if you have a nonprofit building bridges, they won't use it. If you have a nonprofit building software, absolutely they'll use it. Uh, and, you know, in some cases you find that in my view, the nonprofit model means that you have less variables because you don't have profit. Everything has to be reinvested. So you're always aiming for the same endpoint, which is the net zero. And that means that you have some different decisions to make with the investment of uh, uh, capital, with the investment of ongoing um, finances and how that works and where that ends up and how that converts into value. So sometimes having the flexibility of a bit of agility mindset, at least can be useful in a nonprofit environment. Thank you. Uh, final question for the night. Uh, is it important for an organization to adopt a single IT project management approach? Or is it fine to, for example, agile, or is it fine to base the approach on each individual project? If the organization's co governance covers several approaches, let's say, can several be adopted if and when needed? I think yes, and I've seen it happen. I think that it's a question of maturity for the organization and whether or not it works depends upon how program and portfolio management is done because for example, if you have the PMI PMBOK, the Project Management Body of Knowledge, which is very waterfall, if you have that as an overriding portfolio program management tool and you stick a scrum project in underneath that, it, there's going to be some friction. This is where you get ideas like maybe Prince2 strategically is a better parent framework because that's a little more able to say, well, we don't mind as much whether you've got an agile one over here and a waterfall over here for this. Um, and then you have things like, well, if you're mostly uh, agile, maybe Prince2 isn't what you really should have at the top. It's safe or something like that you should have at the top. But the whether or not it works is largely going to depend on how they join together. But you absolutely can have a waterfall for this and an agile for that. Uh, but because they're so different, they absolutely will cause friction unless that friction is managed. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for heaps of questions. Uh, 45 yeah. answered tonight. Um, Fantastic. Of, of about 60. Um, all righty. Well, well, thanks everyone for, for hanging around. Um, thanks, Hannah, for looking after the questions. Uh, we'll be chatting next week about uh, business analysis and IT solutions. Um, so, so stick around for that one. Uh, we'll probably not be able to get you the quiz tonight. We're still, I guess, finalizing the questions and better to, to look at it properly and have a bit of a rest and sort of, um, take a, I guess, a, a, a break before thinking of what's best. Um, and then we'll release that tomorrow and it'll be available at the same time as the recording. Um, I'll, I guess I'll just leave it over to you, Brenton, just to, to say thank you and good night. Um, still 300 people around which is bloody fantastic excellent thank you thank you guy uh thank you hannah uh, for all that tonight thank you to everyone for your fantastic questions uh for for hanging with it uh, for all the comments in the chat group uh, it's terrific uh, i'm delighted that everyone is uh, participating active and enjoying it uh, i loved reading lots of the comments on the forums uh, i'm looking forward to seeing more of them and uh, we'll be back next week for the next installment of it leadership with business analysis until then that's all from me for now Thank you and good night.